there. And uh, so in any case, on Sunday, December 20th, was the ordination ceremony at the Seminary of Bereja, Buenos Aires, Argentina. This is a summary of what we have been informed. It comes to me from Father Trincado. Uh, the sermon preached by Bishop Filet on that occasion. So the sermon, of course, will be preached in Spanish. He recalled that that in the audience that he had with Pope Benedict XVI on August 29, 2005, Benedict XVI scolded him, saying, "You have as you 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 behave as vague clerics, leaning on a subjective state of necessity, and." You do not realize the canonical irregularity that you represent. We are recognized as Catholics should solve problems, or at least you should try solving them. And Bishop Filet said he responded, Holy Father, you are right. Then to explain the necessity, he, Bishop Filet made a comparison with a natural disaster and blocked firefighters and justified the action of the priests with the norms of canon law. If an orthodox, an excommunicated, or a suspended, or a schismatic can give sacraments to the dying, why not an SSPX priest? The SSPX has supplied jurisdiction. We should never be vague clergy. The problem of jurisdiction demonstrates the importance of being recognized canonically. We cannot say that it is not important to have the Catholic seal we must have the seal, the seal of approval of Rome. Hence our interest to keep in touch with the Roman authorities for obtaining that seal, as it always has the, the, the founder, has always desired the founder. I never wanted to cut with Rome, and therefore always maintain contacts. The official church is the visible church, it is the Catholic church. So Bishop Filet said in the sermon just a couple of days ago that uh, one of the points here that the comparing our legality of the SSPX priest, you know if a priest leaves the priesthood, becomes a Satanist, uh, gets married, has 25 kids, uh, abandons the Catholic faith, it doesn't matter. If someone's dying, that priest can anoint. And so Bishop Filet says, well, if, if a priest who left the priesthood, who's a Satanist and uh, does all evil things, can anoint somebody, then why not the SSPX priest? So that we're being compared to a priest who left the priesthood, a schismatic priest, a, uh, a, a, a completely priest who became completely pagan, and in the danger of death, that priest can offer, the, can give the sacraments to the dying. And, uh, you know, confession and anointing. So... The Bishop Filet says that's a comparison of us. So he no longer understands the state of necessity in the church. We're not compared to those priests. We are fulfilling the necessity of, of uh, the crisis in the church right now. Souls need the true faith without compromise and they need the true sacraments. And therefore the priest not only has a jurisdiction to apply for the church, but an obligation to provide the sacraments, and not only in the state of death, not only in the time of dying, you're not in a danger of dying today, well, unless, you know, the, the black helicopter blows up the house, uh, but the fact is, you're not visibly in the danger of dying right now, and so, whereas, see, if I was a priest that left the priesthood, or if there was a priest that became a Satanist or whatever, you couldn't go to that priest's mass, you couldn't hear that priest, uh, go, you, you couldn't go to that priest in normal circumstances, only for confession and anointing, than curriculum mortis in an extreme case. And so it's a bad understanding, a very bad example, and how important it is to be recognized by the seal of the church. And this Bishop Blaise has been talking about since 2012 in a visible way, but more and more so. Remember, Pope Francis gets worse and worse. Remember one of the things that they said, the conservatives of the SSPX, when Pope Francis became the Pope. Well, don't worry, as long as he's Pope, there'll never be a deal with Rome. As long as he's Pope, you know, there's never going to be a problem. Well, not only has have things continued since Benedict XVI to John to, the, to Francis, they've, they've accelerated. Now, don't forget that he's a third Pope. It was John, first I heard in 2001, we've got to be united with Rome because John Paul II is getting old. And he wants to rectify the problem of the SSPX before he dies. 
And it's urgent because the Pope is getting angry. I mean, the Pope is getting old and he's dying. So it's urgent. We must do this before John Paul II died. Then he died. Benedict of the 16th, it's urgent. We must do this Benedict of the 16th. Now we quit. Now it's urgent with Pope Francis. We've got 15 years now of urgency. And there's a different reason why it's urgent. Because Pope John Paul II is dying. Because Pope Benedict is... Uh, you know, working really hard, he wants to take this very quickly, and then now because Pope Francis is, you know, the Pope. And so, and we've got to work with him. So this, the modernism continues. That's why it's so dangerous to continue in the mainstream of the society, because this is every day now. This is it's no longer, there's not even an uproar. If this statement had been made in 2012, yeah. there would be a massive uproar. Yeah. This didn't even make the newspapers. <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> One reason why nobody cares is because everybody knows, including the guys on the inside, the conservative guys on the inside of SPX, that the deal is a done deal. Mm -hmm. And that we've already given in on the faith. We've already lost our truth, already lost our innocence, already lost our faith. It's already gone. So who cares about the day of the burial? The death of the SSPX is complete. The day of the burial, you know, is irrelevant. Is irrelevant. And so that's all that, that's being arranged. And remember, this deal is a distraction. It's unimportant. But here again, what's important is the doctrine behind it. We must be approved by the official modernist Rome. And that's what the founder always wanted. Now anybody anybody who knows SSPX 101 knows that that's not what Bishop Archbishop have always wanted. What he wanted was Rome to come back to the faith See, when we know we're we know we're standing on the servitude of the faith. Remember one of the attacks made against us? Same attack made against Father Hannafin in Kentucky when he was a the pastor there. Same attack made against Archbishop Lefebvre. Same attack made against all SSPX priests, traditional priests previous to the nineteen uh, to to recent times. Do you think you're the only one that holds the truth? You mean you think you're the only one that knows the truth? No, I don't know the numbers of those that hold the truth, but I know that I know the truth. And anybody that knows differently, knows wrongly. I know that you cannot compromise with modernism. I know you cannot accept the indulged mass. I know that it's wrong to go to the mainstream SSPX masses because it's a compromise of faith. I know that it's wrong to go to the indul. I know it's wrong to go to the say to be mass. Does that mean you're the only one? I don't know. That's not my problem. My problem is to know what the error is and what the truth is. As far as the quantity of people who know the truth, that's not important. That's God's problem. We, of course, want to spread it to as many people as possible. And there's another point, I'm going to mention in the, maybe in the, in the sermon tomorrow, but the, in the gospel today, not the gospel, the last gospel, remember, because the last gospel was the first gospel, the actual last gospel was a different gospel. And in the gospel, what happened? It's the one about Herod. The three kings go to Herod because this star disappears when they arrive in Israel. They saw it until they got in Israel. They couldn't see it anymore. And then when they got in Israel, they had to go and ask, where is the king going to be born? The star disappeared. They went to, to Herod. And what does it say? And Herod inquired diligently. And he gathered the three kings secretly. <laughs> And he told them to go to the place where the child was laid and record everything and come back and tell him all about it. That's called pockets of resistance, <laughs> secret communication of the truth. Why did Herod do things secretly? Whenever you do things secretly, it's for an evil purpose not a good one. And it doesn't lead to the truth or to good. If he really he lived in Israel, he knew that he knew the roads better than the three kings did. He knew how to get to Bethlehem. It was only about 60 miles away, by the way. So why didn't he go on his go on a little trip over to Bethlehem? He wouldn't walk across a street for Jesus Christ. He wouldn't walk across a palace to see Christ. So what did he do? He inquired Klam secretly, diligently. 
And this is the problem of modern education, of modern academia. They want to study diligently, and they want to study eagerly and secretly all the secrets of nature. They want to study secretly all the things happening. Bishop Fillet wants to study secretly what's going on with Rome. We want to study secretly what's going on in the church. We can't make too much noise. We have to study secretly and diligently. It's also the era of Bishop Williamson right now. Secretly and diligently. We cannot study the faith secretly and diligently. We are not in the time of persecution. We've mentioned many times recently, if I wanted the same ass on the White House lawn, I could do it. You have to go through the idiot process of red tape and permits. But eventually I could say mass on the White House lawn. It's legal. We are not yet in the time of persecution. We cannot be secret about the faith. And there in the gospel today, secretly, diligently, inquiring in great detail the time. Why did Herod inquire in great detail the time? To guess the age of the child. So he would know about what age to kill. That's the reason why some fathers of the church say, like St. Augustine yesterday, he says that the, th the star appeared on December 25th. And the three kings were on top of a mountain. And that three stars appeared in the sky, and they came together to form one star. And the three kings saw it, and they decided to follow the star. And one year later, six months, one year later, they arrived in Bethlehem. Other saints say that the star appeared maybe at the time of the conception of, of, of the, you know, uh, March 25th. And then the kings gathered together and traveled so that they arrived on January 6th, only a few days after uh, Easter, after Christmas. So you have a different schedule by depending upon the saint. But they're responding and traveling. The others are secretly reacting. And that's what we mean. We can't have that secret, diligent, studying, precise time why is it so important the time? So that Herod would say, kill every boy child from two years old and down. And that's why St. Jerome says, we know it had to be less than a year between the star's apparition and the coming of the major, because Herod would take no chances. He'd give himself a big cushion. Kill everybody that was a little boy. Anybody who looks like they're about one, two years old. They look small enough, kill them just to be on the safe side. And so he killed every child, every boy, two years old and young. Inquire diligently, but why? Many people inquire diligently. They want to study more. Very often when you want to study more, it's not because you don't know the truth, it's because you want an excuse for not knowing the truth. Because if you know the truth, you have to respond to it. Like Herod on Good Friday. What is truth? Then he turns his back on the truth and walks away. He asks, our Lord says, I am the truth. And then when he gets the answer, he asks a question. That's another sign of the presence of the devil. When you get an answer, you ask a question. Normally you get an answer, you memorize it. When you put it into practice. But the devil, when he gets an answer, he asks a question. So, in any case, you better back the answer a little bit. Did you stay awake? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. You can make your mouth a You can open it up. Okay, are there any sacred coffee heading around New York? Or any kind of brewing, Father. Okay, all right, good. Father, when you say Bishop Williamson is uh, conducting in secret, right? what specifically are you referring to? Okay, what he, what he is, one of the, there's two things he's against in the resistance. One is organization. That's his most public about that. Two is noise. You know, one of the points of Bishop Williamson is, thou shalt not make noise. And one of the problems of Father Pfeiffer is that he makes noise. So, you know, walk into a room, things aren't breaking, and, you know, windows and doors, something happens. And so he doesn't like the noise. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So that we need to be quiet. For instance, when he travels around, when he came here to St. Catherine's, for instance, he didn't come to St. Catherine's, he went to secretly visit Father Gruner, who was only found out by accident that he was coming. And he arranged his trip to Brazil, his trip to Mexico, his trip to Canada, all in mass. It was only discovered afterwards that he was going to be here. And they asked him, well, can you do confirmations? 
And at first he wasn't really going to. And then he just changed his mind and said, well, okay, I'll, I'll be 25 minutes away, so for two or three days, so I might as well stop in and do the formations. But he wants to operate quietly. And uh, that's why, you know, for instance, he's there in, in Kent and, uh, you know, Broadstairs, not as a priory, but as a quiet place where people can secretly... Remember he said in his first latest on comments uh, about the new building, where people, where priests can come and discreetly visit the bishop. Right? Discreetly. So this discreetly is it's kind of in his nature to want to operate. He wasn't that way before 2009. He's not visible. But since 2009, he's been that way big time. Although he always has been discreet, he's always been friends with Jewish rabbis, with Sedevicantus priests, with um, Rabbi Schiller used to come to the seminary and give talks. He was a young Jewish rabbi in New York City. He used to come and give talks about, because he was, you know, some of the Jews are actually mad at the Jews, you know. It's not this the goy that they're mad at the Jews. It was Jews that are mad at the Jews. And Rabbi Schiller, I mean, he was he, he was a Jew. He loved being a Jew. He's proud of his Judaism, but he didn't like Zionism. He didn't like you know the, this New World Order stuff. So he would come and give talks at the seminary about you know kind of like a Jews for Jesus thing. You know, <laughs> he wasn't he was not Christian at all, but he didn't like the the he didn't like the the Holocaust, uh, what do you call it? They call it, Jews have a name for it, Holocaust machine. It's a, it's a money-making machine. Many Jews don't like it. I think it's because they're not in the, you know, they're not in the receiving end of that. <laughs> yeah, Holocaust industry. So the Jews have a name for it. They have a name for it. Holocaust industry, something like that. Yeah. So, and I think Rabbi Schiller was one of those. And so he's always had these secret friends of quiet. He's kind of always had that. I think part of it is because he's an eccentric individual. And he's always had those friends that have you know, come from all different sides. But now that he's, he's in, the, in the public as a, as a, in a leader, leadership position, he's a, he's, he doesn't want to see a failure. He doesn't want to see a collapse. So he wants to operate quietly and secretly. And he always has escape, you know, he always has escape plans. Like, instead of having windows and walls, what are the walls or the windows? They're all exits, and then what's the window is the actual wall. So he's got escape, you know, spots everywhere. And uh, but sometimes, oh, there's not a time for that. There's not a time for that. And um, you know, for instance, he's, so he's, he's he's against the noise. He's against the going after the sheep. Like he told me when I was in in London the last time. He said, we cannot have a priest in our times. We cannot have a priest who goes after the lost at any cost. Hmm. We cannot have this. We must have a balanced priest who just is ordered, doesn't overstretch his bounds. But you cannot have one who's going after the lost sheep. So he's against that. He's against any kind. It's good if he has a reputation for being extreme. But in fact, he's against all extremism. That's why, for instance, we got the Holocaust. He says that evidence says that there was no six million Jews. He doesn't say no six million Jews were killed. The evidence indicates that no six million Jews were killed. And you shouldn't be an extremist and say it's absolutely certain that they were killed. And then you follow the evidence. The evidence indicates that they weren't six million killed. But if you show me evidence that there were six million, then I'll change my mind. See, that's his personality. Whereas most would say, like Ernst Zundel would say, there were not six million killed, period. Finished. Any further questions? Forget it. Impossible. I already investigated. I already found the answer. And that's it. Period. Finished. Now, Ms. Williamson doesn't have that approach. I remember in the seminary, we had in my, and one year below me, it was a Puerto Rican named uh, Paul Roman. He got already into priest in the Germany has seen Peter, and now he's a regular Novus Ordo priest. He says both Latin Mass and New Mass now. We were the, and Paul Roman, you know, when Father Bishop went to the Holocaust, he goes, ah, Bishop, you're crazy. He would say that in class, you know. Well, you know, Mr. Roman, you might be right. 
but you must read the evidence. So we read in the Herald Sunday, you know, report on the gas chambers. And then Paul Roman, he was a, uh, what do you call that, uh, pharmacist. So his handwriting was horrible, right? So Bishop Williamson would make him every Wednesday, he would sit in Bishop Williamson's office and do penmanship. So he would sit in the office and do penmanship. While he was doing penmanship, Bishop Williamson was reading to him the Herald Sunday report, the, uh, the proof that there was no Holocaust. Would you believe now, Paul? <laughs> so he tried to convince him, but he never was angry that he didn't believe. And he never, he never punished him for not believing either. He just let him go. You know. And then Paul ended up leaving anyway, but not because of, uh, he was never kicked out by the bishop, never punished by the bishop, never threatened by the bishop. He was just trying to get him to agree because of the evidence. But he could care less about the evidence. Mm -hmm. care less. And so, he like remember those back in the early, well, about 1990 or something like that. So his style is an academic, he's a teacher for all these generations. And so a teacher, a teacher style he has, which is a little different than the warrior style. A warrior, you know, you gotta, when you shoot somebody, that means they're dead. Right? And when you get shot, that means you're dead. Whereas in, in, a, in a test, you get an F, you can always redo another test. Hmm. It's a very different, you can redo the grade, you can, you know. So it's, it's a different mentality of how to deal with difficulties. You know. When we try to give him the benefit of the doubt, we think that he is just trying to make us think. Right. But then he says something, so we have to question what he's saying. Well, the thing is, he's been clear about the fact that he's against organization. He's against the seminary. He's been clear about that from the very beginning. And he doesn't think our sense of the FEV uh, did the right thing when he established a hierarchical structure. Too much authority in it. So he's been, he hasn't, he's been clear about that. It's just that people don't want to believe that he believes that. So they're projecting their desires into him. But he's never ever said. He, for instance, he said many times, I will not be the leader of a movement. But in fact, he is. Because if you don't agree with him in his non-movement, then he's going to use his authority to break you apart. Mm -hmm. you see? So if he really doesn't believe in the movement, let the movement be on its own. Let us be on our own. Mm -hmm. No problem. So it, because, you see, you can't change the nature of things. He's still a bishop, whether he believes it or not, knows it or not, or likes it or not. He's still a bishop. Mm -hmm. It's like the Pope is a Pope if he doesn't know it. And he's, he is affecting the church, whether he likes it or not, or knows it or not. And so Bishop Williamson, the, the four bishops do the same thing. They're affecting the church. Bishop Tissier is doing wrong by doing nothing in Chicago. He's affecting the church because he's supposed to be out there doing his duty as a bishop. Bishop Fillet is supposed to be doing his, his duty, and he's not. Bishop Galloway is not. And Bishop Williamson is struggling in between. So and and so meanwhile we have to we have to continue. The truth is gonna what's gonna end at the end. What's gonna win in the end. Even, you know, and so we still have to have a seminary and the bishop doesn't agree with it. You know, he gives us some smiles, but he doesn't agree with it. We don't have any certainty for our future. No more for us. And the young men know that. And it has stopped some men. We have about 20 men that have passed through the doors. There would have been easily 40. At least more than 30. If they thought that there was some, some real support for Bishop Williamson. This year, this year, seven men, Father Rue announced it, seven people took the promise of the SSPX, their first promises. That's the smallest number of seminarians ever. Yeah. When I took my promises in 1989, there were, well, there were, there were, there were about 15 of us. 15, 15 or 19, I forget which, but it was 15 or 19. Father Hugo was his class, it was two years before me. It was about, say, 15 or 19. Late 90s or like 30 sometimes. Yeah, well, not the first ones. Normally it would be 50 or whatever, renewing. But I'm talking about the very first, which is only one class. Right, so normally twenty, and that's just in Winona. But the whole society would be about forty or something. But now, but here were seven in Winona. This is very bad. I've never seen it that small before. And seven took the perpetual. 
They missed all seven priests coming back to Alma Mater and doing their perpetual. Now that's unusual. We never have to come back and do that. And also, we've always, the other interesting thing is that I think we never really, our big day is taking the cast. December the 8th is our principal day, but we don't ever do anything extra special for it. And I think one reason the Levant, Archers of the Web did that is, you know, to keep things in perspective. You were already under obedience anyway when you were in the seminary. You were already under the superior anyway. And this solemn promise that we make to our superior, uh, it's not like a vow, though it is a, a, great, a great obligation attached to it. And so the wisdom in not overemphasizing it. It's very much overemphasized now. Not when I was there, even though it was, it was a great honor to finally belong to the Society of St. Pius X officially, but it was not, it was not you know, congratulations, and that's the end of it. But now they're making a much bigger deal about it because the new principal virtue equals obedience. And they're emphasizing it also because, see, you belong to SSPX, but the SSPX is not regular. So we need to be regularized. So it becomes a tool of deceiving the seminarians. See? You know. And that's and that's that's kind of, you know, we have, you know. So, you know, it becomes a tool to deceive the seminarians, and that's that's a really major, you know, major, major, major problem. And, yeah. what's the rationale uh, behind not having more priests? I mean, it's in the okay, Bishop Williamson, he's talking about it actually for more than 20 years, but especially in recent years. Grace builds on nature. This is the Bishop Williamson thesis. Grace builds on nature. So the supernatural is like a, something up here that's like a crane that grabs onto the natural and picks it up. So if the natural is so broken apart, the supernatural will grab onto it and it's not going to pick up anything, it's just going to fall apart. So therefore, in order for the supernatural to pick up the natural, the natural has to be strengthened. Yes. Okay? Now, and so that's his basic thesis. And the natural has been so destroyed in the modern world that the supernatural can't pick it up. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the truth or error of that statement? Just it's not what is it? It's not the book. It sounds it sounds good, but it's crap. Right, now, well, why is it crap? What? Because God calls it anything. Because, anything. because it's very simple. Yeah, God can do anything. God can do anything. Like one example we mentioned many times is that girl in England. I'm guessing she she died. She'd be dead now. She was she was a little girl who was born with no pupils. She only has the whites of her eyes. She doesn't have an eye. Just basically a white blob here and a white blob there. She went to Padre Pio in the 1950s, and guess what happened? <laughs> but he never gave her eyes. <laughs> no. <laughs> she still had a white blob here and a white blob there. No pupil, no cornea, uh, no lens. So the nature was still demolished, but he gave her vision? So she could see, and she watches TV too, by the way. <laughs> so, she, so she watches TV, she reads the newspaper, she drives the car, and she has no eyes. Just two blobs. And if you block her blobs, she can't see. It shouldn't matter, right? Because she doesn't have any eyes. So you see, God can easily fix the problem, you see. Just like when St. Peter walked on the water. In theory, you got to have a boat. St. Saint Raymond of Vinifort, he got on a coat, right? He got on his jacket and went across the ocean. So the fact is that, that even though grace builds on nature, the very simple explanation is the God who made supernature is the same God that made nature. Mm -hmm. And that nature is created out of... What's the word? Nothing. Okay? It's created out of nothing. And guess what supernature is made out of? Also nothing. And so, and the supernatural is built, infused in the natural, and so it's actually, at face value, when you don't think about it, it sounds reasonable. You see what I mean? It sounds reasonable. Grace builds on nature. You've got to be able to have this crane. If it, if it falls apart, you can't pick it up. At face value, without thinking more about it, it sounds reasonable. But in fact, it's not. It's not. And then, but there is, however, some natural required because the supernatural requires it. 
For instance, only a male can be a priest. Only a living person can be baptized. So there are some natural requirements, but God provides them. God makes sure that they'll be there. And there's another problem. If they weren't there, then what would that mean? Who's guilty? Who's responsible for the damnation of men? If the nature is so corrupted, if my nature is so corrupted that I cannot be saved by grace, then is it my fault if I go to hell? Yeah. No, whose fault is it? God's. It's God's fault, right? <laughs> and that's one of the points of St. Augustine. When, when, when Adam complained to God, God gave to Adam three duties. Name the animals, take care of the garden, rule the earth. He went and did those duties. He came back to God and said that he complained that he was lonely. If he complained about those three duties, God just created Adam. So if God gave Adam the work to do and not the means to do it, who made the mistake? God. God doesn't make mistakes. So therefore, God, man, can rule, name the animals, take care of the garden, and rule the earth without woman. But there's something he can't do. The duty that God didn't mention to Adam right away, which was to increase and multiply. <laughs> After he created Eve, then he said, increase and multiply, and that work cannot be done without the union of man and woman. And so a woman in her nature is a mother, man in his nature is a worker, there are two different things that they do in society. A man can be without a woman. A woman can never be without a man. And so the, there is the whole creation, and God made it that way from the very beginning. And so the, uh, uh, God made everything perfect, and they all fit together. And so it really isn't right to say that the, well, the thesis of Bishop Williamson is nature is falling apart. And we have to strengthen nature. It's true we have to strengthen nature. But if we get over emphasis on the nature part, then we lose the truth. Because God uses, He said it many times, He uses the weak to confound the strong. And so the ignorant to confound the intelligent and so on. Happens all the time. And so even though God has used St. John, St. John, St. John Bosco, for instance, was a mega intelligence. He was a mega brain, right? Many of the saints were mega brains. They were born with naturally incredible intellects and God's supernaturalism. Others were born idiots, like St. Albert the Great. Albert was born an idiot. And he, he ran away from the monastery. And when he ran away from the monastery, he didn't pass his classes, Our Lady appeared to him and said, Where are you going, Albert? Said, I can't take the classes I'm out of here. He said, No, go back. And I will make them easy for you. And then he became a teacher of St. Thomas Aquinas. And how did he get that intelligence? Because of the Blessed Virgin Mary strengthened his mind. John Bosco had it naturally. St. Thomas Aquinas had it naturally. And it was perfected by the supernatural. But not everyone. Albert the Great was an idiot. And he was made a genius. Well, God uses every type. Intelligent, stupid, every single type. If you only use stupid, then it'll be predictable. If you only use intelligent, it'll be predictable. But he uses all according to his, however uh, he wants to sprinkle his graces. Um, but in any case, it was good. And then, uh, Did you notice uh, in uh, Bishop Williamson, just curiosity, uh, his latest letter, he had all these quotes from the Bible, but he used not a uh, Dewey Ranger. He was using some weird edition. I noticed that. Okay. He said, New American Standard Edition. Yeah, so what's he doing? He knows better than that because he's. I think English is his first language. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was weird him quoting that standard. So, yeah. That's true, and it had some weird quote to it that we're all familiar with. And I think part of the problem is he wasn't a Catholic as a child. Yeah. So we you know, we memorized the, the scripture quotes when we were a child, you know, and he probably didn't memorize those quotes. So we hear, you know, he that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth. That matters to us. It has to be said like that. Yeah. But that's what we memorize. Everybody knows that's a Catholic version, right? Okay. You know, not just the Latin, but the English. We have the Catholic Dewey Reigns version. You know, and I think, you know, so many quotes, you know, that um, the, I uh, can't think of another common one, you know, but the, the sower went out to sow seeds, you know, but I can't, you know, common expression. And he used several common quotes there, but not the quote, you know, what we're familiar with, right? right? It's true, it's very unusual. I don't know why he did that. 
But what he said wasn't bad. Mm-hmm. If I remember correctly, it's the subject of suffer or something. I mean, what was it? Who's no? Yeah, yeah, it was a strange, it was like using a Protestant like translation. Heretical. It wasn't a heretical meaning, but it was like using the... That's worse than the, than the King James, at least. The King James yeah. is better. Yeah, but the whole thing seemed a little <laughs> yeah. bit lazy to me. It was just, uh, you know, write a little bit, use all these quotes. Well, oh, yeah, I know it's difficult because he writes every week forever. That's a very difficult thing to do, you know. Um, it seemed like he was bored. So he just yeah. to get it out. Yeah, I understand that, but that happens once in a while. It's no big deal as long as he's communicating the truth. And the question is now is now it's kind of you don't know what he's communicating. I know. What is his message? You know, what's his uh, you know is is what's he trying to get at? That's a big question mark in the last couple of years. You know? I mean, what's your impression? You read the latest on comments and all yeah. that, and that, sometimes they get confused, like this, uh, like a tree that has can have bad fruits and good fruits. Uh, yeah, it is like it has both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's very unusual. It has both, kind of, you know. Yeah, it feels like to be good fruit, uh, good fruit, everything has to be good. Right. It's a little bit of evil damages the whole. It's like a, that's true. A drop of poison on, on water. That's correct. And there's really a question. If it's a mistake, then no big deal. Like, for instance, they say a priest in his first sermon, he's nervous. He's allowed seven heresies. That's what they say. You know, <laughs> no shame, right? You know, because the nervous wreck gets up and says, you know, seven different heresies. He's allowed seven heresies. But why? Because he's a nervous wreck and he's given the wrong quotes, applied to the wrong thing, you know, and so on, right? So the, uh, uh, what do you call it? But, but that's just a mistake. But if it's not a mistake, then it's your evil you're talking about. I mean, what was your what was your it feels like, like he's running away from God's will. And he yeah. made it very clear, I know Archbishop of the Lord do I tend to be when he was here. He made it very clear, but it's not just I'm not gonna be. More than that. Yeah. He's not, not going to allow it to happen. Well that's the sense of God, yeah. It's more than hey, you know, I I I'm a, like for instance, you know, you want to help me push that car up the hill? <laughs> forget it, I'd be my guest, you know. Yeah. I, I, I forget it. But what about when you try to push a car up the hill and I break your legs? <laughs> Needs it. See what I mean? That's different than just, hey, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. He does more than I'm not going to do it. He says that Archers of the Feb made a mistake. And that is spreading throughout the resistance amongst the priests. And they're saying, well, Archers of the Feb did make a mistake. And what was his great mistake? He put too much authority in the Superior General and made the society too structured. Now, just use logic. If Archers of the Feb made a mistake in establishing a structured society with a Superior General at the top, what does that mean? In 1970, what did he do? When he founded the SSPS? Yeah. He, he, what is it? Created a structure. I know. And was that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I say it's a thing. No, no. But if you say, Archers of the Feb made a mistake in putting too much authority in the Spirit General and establishing too tight of a structure, yeah. Therefore, he didn't know what he was doing. He made a mistake when he established the SSPX. The SSPX. He never have done it. Therefore, the SSPX equals a big blunder in the history of the church. Well, so did the church itself, because the Pope has so much authority. Well, more importantly, it's Christ who made the mistake. Right, exactly. Right, because he gave not just the Pope, but the bishops. You know what we say about the bishop? You know the Pope doesn't give authority to the bishop. God said two times. Uh, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. What do you call it? Uh, it's twice. And I who's forget, I forget the, the keys. The power of the keys is said twice. Yeah. Matthew 16, 18, Matthew 18, 18. Matthew 18, 18 is to all 12 apostles. Matthew 16, 18 is to Peter. So Peter has the power of the keys to bind and loose on earth. The apostles have the same power as the Pope. But the only difference is it's localized. It's the only difference. And in fact, the way the way the fathers tell us is that a bishop does not receive authority from the Pope. All the Pope does is say, use your power here. And he can say, no, you can't use your power here. So it's in practice, it's a very similar thing. But it's like, our idea is that he puts the engine inside the bishop, he puts the fuel inside the bishop. He puts the power inside the bishop. And then he says, use it. But that's not what the church says. No. The heaven directly gives power to the bishop. The bishop of Toronto has direct power from heaven straight to the bishop to the faithful. 
Only the Pope designates this is your diocese. And he has the power to pull that away. So bishops have a divine power, which priests don't have. And that's why the Pope is, you know, he's the highest of the bishops. He's the Bishop of Rome. And he has a power to shut down bishops, to create bishops, um, and to shut them down and to apply their, where their jurisdiction is. That's it. So this divine power is really heavy, much heavier than the power of a superior general. And it's been abused millions of times in the last 2,000 years. Our Lord didn't make a mistake in setting up the structure for him. Yeah. That we are very much obliged right. to sacrifice and pray even more for our bishop Williams right. than we are for the priests. Right. We have to sacrifice well, I think what our Lord is asking right now, I think what our Lord is that's true. I think what our Lord is asking right now, we just have, are you willing to do the right thing without any backup? The rule of God without even security. You don't know when the next Mass is going to be. I don't know when the next Mass is going to be, right? We don't know if there is going to be a next Mass. We don't know if the, I don't know the I've been in the seminary. We don't know if they're going to be ordained priests. We don't know if they're going to be ordained. We don't know how it's going to happen. And so, what do we do? Are we ready to keep doing what's right, even without security? I think that's what our Lord is asking of us right now. I think that's what's being asked. And, you know, God will provide a bishop. Thinking maybe he'll convert Bishop Filet. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, if he gets fired, and he's no longer the big cheese, yeah. and he gets crushed by Rome, which is exactly what they're going to do, yes. right? Yes. Who knows? Maybe he'll get saved. He'll go to uh, Billy Graham or uh, what's his name or uh, you know I got saved. You know you never know, right? So God can raise up anybody, and uh, the most logical choice would be Bishop Williamson. But he 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 decided not to stand up in a strong, clear way in 2012, with the result of many souls not responding to grace. Even though many did, many did not. Because they're looking for the leader. It's all part of it. It's the nature of, a, of, of human nature. Yeah. You've got to have a leader. There's no way around it. Like I mentioned an example last night or this morning. Remember in the Alive, in the Alive when the soccer team crashed? Yes. Was that 1970 or 60s? You know, so they crashed in the mountains and they lived and nobody was going to come and get them. What did they do? The first thing they did was elect a superior. Because this is a matter of life and death. Somebody's got to make the decision. We're walking through the jungle that way. None of them had a compass. No one knew which way was north, south, east, or west. They had no idea which way civilization was. And nobody wanted to be the one to make the decision. Because it might be the road and civilization that's right over that next hill. And this way, it's 4,000 miles. So they don't know. Somebody's got to say, all right. We're going that way, even though I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's got to make the final decision, and they got to say, all right, we're all thinking, uh, I think we should go this way, this way, that way. I don't know. It's either right or it's straight. I don't know which one. All right, we're going straight. And tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, let's go. <laughs> Somebody's got to say, let's go. And they go, all right, we're going, knowing that they might die. Several of them died, right? But they lived. They eventually arrived. But they, had, they knew they had to make a decision. And they knew somebody had to make a decision. And there had to be a leader in a life and death situation. We're in a life and death situation. Absolutely. There has to be a leader. And the leader is not, you know, Napoleon. The leader is not Julius Caesar. The leader is going to be chosen from one of the guys that survived the plane crash. <laughs> The captain was a really great leader, but his face is through the windshield, and he's splattered on that rock. <laughs> so we're going to have to go to plan B. And so the fact is, so that, see, you have to take the leader from amongst the individuals that you have. Yeah. There's no other way. I, I wish that they had a bunch of guys who were spelunkers and, you know, cross-country uh, travelers and world adventures and, you know knew everything about nature and what you could eat, what you couldn't eat. It was a bunch of soccer players. <laughs> Did they eat each other? 
I think they did eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, similar to the Donner Pass thing. Is that allowed in circumstances? Um, I think it is. I think it is. Well, that if, it, if you... Friday is considered me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do dispensation. Yeah. Uh, but no. So, in fact, tomorrow is one of those Fridays where you can get a dispensation. Because, you you're, because Easter, well, not Easter, Christmas is on Thursday. Yeah. And you got the, uh, the, what do you call it, the, the leftover ham and all that kind of stuff. So it, tomorrow is one of the days where it's always a custom to give a dispensation. Oh, that's Part of the reason why they gave the station in the old days okay. is because if they didn't, everybody was going to eat meat anyway. And so it was mortal sin in the old days. So that it was very common. They usually gave a dispensation for that. Part of it was because, look, you got, remember in the old days also, you couldn't just go and get, you know, go to the fish. Now you can just go to Captain D's instead of going to, ha to McDonald's, right? But in the old days, it was you didn't have, it wasn't that easy. So before Vatican II, before the modern, so it was very common to give. It was almost it's never a law. It's a dispensation given by the bishop or by the priest, but it was almost universally given in situations like Christmas is on Thursday, then you can eat meat on the Friday, the leftovers, and the, and then you know, and then on the feast days, like for instance, St. Patrick's Day in the United States, you can eat meat, right? Because the Irish are going to do it anyway, and so you know, and so and same thing with other feasts in other places, Immaculate Conception, and so on. It's still the law. It's, that's the reason for dispensation. Dispensation is applied even customarily and universally. Like for instance, Christmas is on a Friday, you can eat meat, right? Yeah. Well, the law still applies. It's just it's a universal, customary dispensation. Do you have to keep asking for it, or no? Uh, with well, something like that, you really don't really need to because it's a kind of a universal, customary dispensation, right? Is that, I want to think it's still a dispensation, but it's a universal, customary, right? It's tradition. Right, it's a tradition, right. With a small t. But a tradition with a small t counts. Like, for instance, you can't have... It's still forbidden to have a missile stand on the altar. It's against the law to have a missile stand on the altar because you can't have furniture on the altar. You're supposed to have a pillow. Now, the problem with a pillow is, like, you know, you're trying to, yeah. you know, but you've got bad eyes or what do you do, stack the pillows and it falls off the altar? You know, and so the... Um, so for more than 100 years, maybe 200 years... People who missile stands on the altar. Yeah. Forbidden. But the bishop never said anything about it because probably the bishop had eye problems as well. <laughs> and so the law still remains. It's forbidden, but by custom, it became a law. It's the rule of custom. Right. So, And then what the church says about that is when a custom has been done for 25 years, the bishop no longer has the authority to can it. Mm. He can't pull out the law that says it's illegal. It's still on the books, you know, that it's illegal. Father, about that turkey or tomorrow, can we actually cook a turkey that we took out of the freezer? Well, now we're getting into like <laughs> 613 precepts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting that in the spot, I'm sorry. No, but you're, well, I mean, if you're allowed to eat meat, meat, meat. So there's no... It's not for me, somebody else wants No, but there's no poverty of matter, so to speak. There's no... If you can eat it, you can eat it. If you can't, you can't. So There's can no she, can like she cook the amount she? of meat. You eat yeah. less meat when you're allowed to eat meat. Yes, I know. You know, yes, there's no okay. uh, other. Yes. Than, good. Good job, yeah. Thank you. So it's, kind of, it's just a customary dispensation. Yeah. Universe. Okay. And you can always get a, a cranky Padre who says, forget it. Okay. Right. Now you can convince Christine. Yes, yeah. I can tell her now. I do a lot too. And she would thought she could. Yeah, but they, normally it's yeah. it better be as leftovers of Christmas. Mm -hmm. That's well, the theory the behind it. But, <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. By the way, how many everybody, how many people live between this is what where people live? Because I mean how many people live on this side of Toronto? Mm -hmm. You're on this side? Yeah. You're also on this side? No, you live in America. Buffalo, yeah. Yeah, so you're this side. Sure. Yeah, this is closer to Toronto by whatever, an hour. Yeah. yeah. But from here to the border is it's less than an hour, isn't it? From here to the border, it's about an hour and a half. Oh, St. Catharines is about 50 minutes, 40 minutes. And then another 30 minutes past that. Yeah. Except you've got to go south to Buffalo. You um, go straight across Niagara Falls, whatever it is. Isn't Niagara no, Falls? Can. It's, yeah, Lewiston or Peace Bridge doesn't really matter. At the same time. Doesn't matter to you which one is the same. For a kid to your home, it's the same. Right, right. Whichever one's got less morons on it. It's <laughs> not the same either way. Right. So. No, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. And in the St. Catherine, anybody in the St. Catherine's direction here? Because most of you are on Toronto side. Oh, you live on the wrong side of Toronto, right? No, no, no. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. You live on the other side, right? Yeah, we're away. Yeah. 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 You live also north. We live by the marsh, right? right. Okay. You which side? You live on this side. No, we live close to San. I mean, like. 20 minutes from St. Catherine. Oh, okay, you're in St. Catherine. Okay, okay. East of uh, Hamilton. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. East of Hamilton right now. You're the representative of St. Catherine. Well, Hamilton, Hamilton, Hamilton was on the turn. I thought Hamilton was on the turn. Is on the horseshoe. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but I thought well, we were on the other side of the turn. Aren't we on the other side between Hamilton? We're on the northern side. We're not. Yeah. Oh, we're on the north side. So yeah. we never went through Hamilton on the way here. We stayed on the perimeter. Yeah, okay, so we're on the north side. I, th I, th I got in my head that we're on the south. That's oh, we're almost in Hamilton. Okay, okay. That's, that's I got that's in that's our heads that we're over here. But what happened is that the so lake is, right is in the, the south middle. side. The lake is more or less is Hamilton, right? Yeah. Okay, all right. Which is the middle of the lake? Which three ladies coming from uh, Windsor? Windsor. Three hours. They're like three, four hours, yeah. Oh, okay. Wait a minute, that's... Detroit, right? Yeah, pretty right. much Detroit. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Right, okay. All right, yeah. They want you to start a mass under their phone. I know. I already tried, actually. But they canceled the times, whatever. Because I, I, I can only go on a weekend in which I get stuck. So I tried going twice now. But the places where I was going to go, they said, no, no, forget about it, you know. Is some, who's from Windsor here? Somebody get from? They left? They left, okay. Do they live on the Canadian side or American side? Canadian side. Are they gone? Yeah. Okay. So you're you're seeing Catherine. No, I'm up in Barrie. Yeah, we're up. We're right north. We're north. The Martyr Shrine. I don't know where the Martyr Shrine is. No, that's on the other side. That's even further than you, right? Further than Square Fisher. 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 Okay. Due north and west. East. Yeah, we're north of Toronto. Northwest. Just basically northwest. Northwest. Oh, yeah. If we were going to society, we would go for Aurelia. Okay. Okay, so it took you an hour and a half to get here? Two hours? Two, two. Yeah, we have quite a few two hour drivers in Sparta, New Jersey, but they go either way. Sometimes they go, we had somebody from, because they go from Pennsylvania, they go across that way. And um, the Corsicans are so spread out around here. But this is 80, this is about 60% of the whole population of Canada is here. Yeah. 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 Isn't that right? A third. A third. A third of the population. third of the, and the entire population of the whole country, right? Between St. Catharines and Toronto, right? Yeah. This whole area. Right? It's busy. We're from Vancouver. We're yeah, right, right. And then after that, Calgary is next, right? No, Montreal. 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 Then Calgary, right? Vancouver. I think Vancouver. Vancouver. Vancouver is bigger than Calgary. Yeah. It's yeah. Vancouver. Calgary is bigger during the stampede, but the <laughs> 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 uh, okay, I thought Calgary was uh, the third biggest. Right. Um, if I, I have to put, I mean, two, yeah. two things I wanted to say. Um, Padre Fernando in Colombia, he has a, a seminarian that he's training. Yeah. So may I suggest if you and Padre go have uh, people willing to go to the seminary, just uh, uh, educate them, train them, teach them, and well, good willing. Uh, right, right now we have about, you. we've had 20 past the doors already about that. We have about um, 11 there right now, or 12. But some are for the brotherhood, not for the priesthood. Maybe, you know, so I'll say about nine uh, study for the priesthood. And then we have, um, we have three Nigerians who are on their way. Three Paraguay, I mean three Brazilians that have been on their way forever, and uh, then we have two from the Philippines that are on their way, and then and then we have um, uh, there's actually again there's a there's, there's a Polish priest who's trying to come over and visit, um, uh, and uh, just spend some time a Polish priest from uh, wherever somewhere north I don't know where he is. you know and so he's northwest northwest. Poland somewhere, and uh, but you know, we have to work on him. And then there's a, uh, and then we have a, uh, uh, so the, again, and then there's there's also Americans that want to be coming next year as well. And then remember, some of the Brotherhood, some of the brotherhood, I'm putting them all together. They're going together in the same class. It was an exception, like we have two lay brothers that are just doing work separately. But then we have the others. They're all in the class together. 
and then uh, and so with the brothers who might be you know strict on the grading or whatever, but they have to go through the because they'll be teaching catechism and so on, and also you know working you know for the apostle. And so we don't know what the future holds. Be there. Yeah, you know, but we have to continue. Yes. So if Bishop Williamson doesn't approve of your seminary, is he really willing to ordain them? He basically tolerates. Doesn't he approve? Agree? He tolerates. Right now, I would say probably not. But it, but it's one of those things that uh, he doesn't say yes and he doesn't say no. But hasn't given him the grace because he hasn't put him in that situation yet. Well, he, well, I mean, for, for minor orders and things like that, but he hasn't done that. Remember, there's seven steps in the priesthood. There's eight, actually. There's tonsure, and then order, lecture, exes, acolyte, subdeacon, deacon, and priest. What's highest in the seminary right now, Father? Right now? What's the highest you guys are subdeacons, or what would there? No, there's no subdeacons right now. We've got one duty over there priest in June, but he's not going to be a fuck Dr. Sunil. He's very good, but he's not going to be with us. He's going to be in India. And so he'll probably be ordained in India. He might be ordained in Kentucky, but probably be ordained in India or Philippines or England or something. Um, because the, I think that the, it's, it's, it, it, so, but, and that's assuming the bishop doesn't, because the bishop, he might change his mind, but hopefully he doesn't. He's agreed to ordain him, but we'll see. Right. No, the bishop in India is going to No, Bishop Williamson. <laughs> okay. He must be ordained in India. He could be ordained in Kentucky, but most likely India or, you know, England or wherever. Because I don't think so. You know, it's, he, he's visited already multiple times. He's only done confirmations and talks just and retreats, but he won't do the ordinations. So unnatural for a bishop to not do ordinations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, he believes yeah. the seminary yeah. is not yeah. the answer. Okay. Well, then if you don't have to but he wants yeah. he's wanted to do ordained priests, but his idea is professionals, men of the world, and I think he, I don't think he's thinking of the consequences. Because now he's getting ready to die. Yes. But imagine that you are a 30-year-old man, 25-year-old, yeah. 30-year-old, 35-year-old guy, and you're going to be ordained a priest. And now you're ordained a priest because Bishop Williams ordained you last Saturday. Now you got to go find a parish, and you're going to be like this priest who's just a vagabond traveling around. If one of those priests shows up here, what are you going to do? What are the faithful going to do? Are they going to accept it? Chances are pretty slim, right? And what happens to those priests? Because the state of the have many of them. You know what happens to them? They become the slaves of whatever people own them. Yes. They become like a little dog, you know? Yeah, and everything's provided. Right? So they, they, they you know those state of the priests? Many of them are not state of the Contest. They're actually state of the Contest because their owner is a state of the Contest. <laughs> And because if they don't obey their owner, they go in the streets. And if they decide to become padre and start running the parish, like for instance saying, we don't want these flowers on the altar, that's it. <laughs> They're gone, right? It's called lay investiture. That's what's going to happen. Very few of the priests would overcome it, and that's because of their personalities, or because just because there's, you know, they they, they can they can outmaneuver the guy that's trying to enslave them. But that's not how you work, right? No, he's supposed to be the shepherd. He'll be the shepherd, and then what happens is even if the the guy who's the owner is a nice guy, people know that this priest is the priest of that guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if he is ever not obedient to that guy, he's gone. That's the danger, for instance, what's happening right now to Father Gerard. Uh, mm. mm. He's going to become the priest of Vancouver. I don't think so. We came from there. He's got a pretty big publish on his parish. No, but the problem is that it can't, you, see, you can't change nature, you see. No, but they listen to him. Like, no, they do now, but be they patient. Have, we were with them. I know that, but that's because he was with the society for many years, right? Yeah. Well, now, but if it continues and continues and continues, one day, not today, not tomorrow, right? Somebody is going to have more influence than somebody else. Yeah, that was happening. It's human nature. What about yourself, Father? Myself? Is, what happens is this. With the, myself, the same danger, of course, is there. But with us, what's very important is, that's one reason why it's important to have, one of the practical reasons why it's important to have missions. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's very, very important to have multiple missions yeah. because when you have multiple missions, then it, it becomes more clear. Not only that, but an organization. 
So that even though we're small, we're an organization. There's a superior, there's a hierarchy, I'm the superior, Father Hugo is under me, Father Boyd comes and helps out, Father Gerard came and helped out for a while. And then other priests come and helped out, most of the short term. Or they help only limited areas. But what happens is, is, is that then, the, the, because the problem of lay investiture is a very deep problem nowadays. The Bishop Williamson told Father Gerard, make a contract. Now, when you, when you make a contract, that's a very dangerous thing. For instance, he told me he's got a contract where he's going to see Mass there every single Sunday, and that he'd made the contract with the people that are going to have Mass every Sunday. So I tried to get him to come over here, tried to get him to go to Quebec. He won't do it. It's true, he's signed a contract to lease that building every Sunday. He no, no, that's a practical, that's nothing. That's just renting. That means nothing. Sure. But that's just a practical, that's nothing. That's no big deal. And he's also got a beautiful altar well, he set said, up. He said, I don't get he said, you know, if you want me here, there's people who want me across Canada. I don't have to stay in Vancouver. I need to know. I don't earn money. So I need to know that you will be, be supporting your priests. I need to know what you can. Right, well, that's, that's, I mean, out so that no, I, if others are very I good, go I won't stay. but again, that's kind of, um, we got to have confidence in providence, you know. God will provide. Father, Father's got the faith. He's got the true faith. And he's teaching the truth. So he'll always be taken care of, you see, as long as he does that. Mm -hmm. And he'll always have problems, of course, because you're always going to have problems. You know? mm -hmm. You're going to have original sin problems and human nature is human nature. You're going to have parish problems and the choir and the servers hate each other and the, you know, <laughs> this guy brought the green flower. And every parish has usually a World War III crisis over flowers. <laughs> I thought about banning flowers. Hmm? But you see, there's every parish at some point there's a World War III crisis over flowers. It's stupid. Are you allowed but, to have fake flowers on the altar? Well, you can, but but that's another crisis. Uh, you know, but no, I hate fake flowers. It's allowed though. Yeah. It's allowed. It's, but it really it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. This phenomenon is not just something you're restricted to resistance. It, I saw it in the uh, Toronto parish. Yeah. Uh, there were certain families because when I worked. You could take it. at the church for yeah, it's human nature. Yeah. Well, there was yeah, a right? where I was invited to some place along with the priest. I didn't want to go because they didn't quite like the people. But the priest said, you must uh, obtain the favor of this family. Or yeah, that happens. Which, that happens. But remember, it's happened to kings, right? Yeah. Human nature is human nature is human nature. Original sin is original sin. You know, and it's happened that you know kings are controlled by the, the, the local rich duke or even yeah. Rasputin. Yeah. Tsar Nicholas yeah. was basically yeah. controlled by Rasputin because he had a sick kid, and mommy liked Rasputin because Rasputin was keeping the kid from dying, and then daddy had to survive by making mommy happy, and so Rasputin <laughs> ran the empire. And that's and that's why the Russians tried to kill Rasputin, and they thought that by killing Rasputin, Russia would be all right. Now it's too late, you know. Five will be late. You mentioned it, Father Brunet, and what's the name with him? He had this great, I mean, not great, I mean, a huge presentation, invited uh, people like Ron Paul, uh, Monsignor Tele, and stuff, and then I saw him at the confirmations. Right, yes. 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 Father, Father Bruner, he supports the resistance. He, I visited him, he supports me, he supports Father Hugo, but he's also. He kind of supports everybody. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, remember, Father Bruner is kind of a little bit of a space cadet, right? Yeah. 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 Right? If he walks from here out, there's a 60% chance he's going to make it through one of those doors. <laughs> right? I mean, he can end up out the window, into the wall, you know, yeah. he's Father Bruner, you know, right? Yeah. You know, so every day you don't know who's in the same mask, you know. And he never, ever knows that you should put the mask in together, right? So every single day, where's the candlesticks? Because he's traveling all the time. Where's the candlesticks? Did somebody find the crook? Where's the chalice? Where's the patent? Where's the altar? Like, he just all goes every day. So it was just Father Gruner's nature, because he's so thinking about the Phantom of Apostolate, and he's so much of a, he's, you know, he's an unusual guy, right? But he does hold the truth, in this, and, he, and I, I have a good conversation with him, Father Tim and my brother and I, we have many, many talks with Father Gruner. He does hold the truth, he's got the faith, he doesn't believe in modernism. I think he's making a, an error in practical judgment. Because what he's trying to do is, he's trying to, you know, get them to, through Fatima, come to tradition. Yeah. And that's good, but in order to do it, he's like being quiet yeah. about the Latin Mass. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. And that's really not good. Like when he came to India, he had 400 priests. And of course, he always does do it in such a way that I was busy. I couldn't. He came to Madras, and I was in Madras at the time. And I, you know, and I, I had to be going. Was sick. He comes at like Holy Week or, you know, he always schedules. I forget what the season was, but I had to be in like 10 different places at the same time. I was able to visit them briefly and talk about the greater and so on. But he used to have the Latin Mass. He had them say, they were saying the new Mass. And he was trying to, to talk to them about the Latin Mass. Vatican II was evil and all that sort of thing. And then he was, he was trying to get them to come to tradition and get, at least put in devotion with Lady Fatima and all their parishes in India. And, uh, but you see, I think you'll have them say the new Mass there. Well, they shouldn't have done that, right? And then he had a he had a high mass. Some of them didn't even know it was in the Latin mass because he said it privately. Then he had one public mass about the Perez or something like that. So it wasn't he wasn't clear. So I think it was he was trying to do the indirect. He's a hundred percent against the new mass. He's a hundred percent against Vatican II. He's a hundred percent against all the liberalism in Vatican II. He accepted his grave error, but he's thinking of it like an apostolic approach. And I think that's where he's making his mistake. I think he's making a mistake there. Yeah, but he's trying to like, you know, because he, he's he's got a problem because he's trying to get double zone bishops consecrated to Russia and back on America. And he knows that once they do that, then the problem's solved. But if he goes and then talks about, you know, Lumen Gentium and uh, uh, you know what do you call it, Humani Vitae and that's another horrible document. Which Whitman said was a good one a couple of weeks ago when he was here. What was it? Was that here he said Humani Vitae was good? Where was it? It was recent. That was here. Where did you say that? It was very recent. It's not about Humana Vitae. Was good. You know, but the thing is, with Humana Vitae, you know, it's NFP, it's, it's wrong theology, order of marriage, you know. Um, it, it, it's the only good part of it is against, you know, what do you call it? Um, uh, artificial yeah, it's against artificial conception, which of course is good, but many pagans are against that, you know. Some people have been you talking about natural law, right? Yeah, I know. Some people have been talking about. Right now. Excuse me. We're holding back a tsunami in there. Oh, tsunami! Yes. Yes. The, the kids are getting hungry. Uh, oh, okay. We can say the prayer here, and they, they got fiddles in there. No, we can bring some to them. No, the, the kitchen is behind you. Oh, okay. Well, then we'll just say a prayer. They can go and get the. the okay. The, the